In order to turn our two-stage loader into an actual operating system, the next thing we need to take care of are interrupts. In order to make the task more concrete, let's take one specific case where we'd like to use an interrupt, and that is turning our UART printing asynchronous. The sequence of events right now is this. The control CPU can write on the data bus to a special register that outputs data to the UART. This is done by way of setting command valid and the proper address for the payload. This operation can be slowed down, something called the back pressure, by means of the dbas command ready. If that is low, i.e. zero, this will not move forward until this is ready. If we follow this line, we see it comes from the IOB, which is usually called an interconnect. This takes the bus from the CPU and routes it to whatever device should answer the specific address we used. So in our case, it would route it to the UART. The routing doesn't take place only for the request, it also takes place for the back pressure through the request ACK line. So if we follow that, we get to the UART controller. So the UART controller has a single byte it can store inside in a register, which is the UART send data register. When that register is not empty, it will trigger a low on the request ACK, causing the CPU to halt until it can send the data. So essentially, the first byte goes through immediately and any byte following that just waits for the previous data to be sent. Which brings up the question, wait for how long? The answer is quite a while. Our UART is set to 115,200 baud, which means we send these many protocol elements, called symbols, per second. Do a one over and we get how many seconds per symbol. Each bit we send takes a symbol, but we also need two symbols for the start and stop bits. So each byte takes us 10 symbols. So we multiply by 10 and we get how long it takes us to send a single byte. Store that aside. Our clock works at 75 megahertz, which means that each cycle takes these many seconds. Divide that by how long it takes us to take to send a word. Reverse. And we get that each byte we send takes 6,500 cycles. So we send data on the UART approximately 6,000 times slower than we execute code. But what if we didn't have to wait for the byte to actually go out for us to continue execution? What if we could just store the byte somewhere and it will go out when it's ready and we can in the meanwhile continue executing other code? We could create hardware to do that, I guess, but that would take up hardware. We're designing CompuSAR to be minimalistic in hardware use. So we'll do that with software and we'll use interrupts. So how do these work? The RISC-V has three interrupt lines. These are called external interrupt, timer interrupt, and not appearing here, software interrupt. Here it is, not connected. When any of those lines go to one, the CPU stops what it's doing and jumps to a predefined handler, which in the RISC-V world is called a trap vector. And the code there is supposed to handle the interrupt and then get back to whatever it was doing before. According to the specs, software interrupt is interrupt that arrives from a different CPU in the system. Timer interrupt is, well, timer, and external interrupt or any other external device that may be relevant. Now, there is no practical difference for handling the different interrupt types, so we can just ignore these definitions, but we do need timer support and we do need external devices support, and we will have another CPU, the 8-bit side of the system, and that will need to give us interrupts, which we will use the software for. So we'll follow along with this definition. But we may have more than one device that will give us an interrupt. So how do we differentiate between them? This is done with the interrupt controller. Now, right now, we only have one interrupt defined, but we leave room for more in the future. 
So those goes into the IRQ or interrupt request lines. Right now it's only connected to the UART controller. And then the interrupt controller can decide whether the interrupt is important, needs to be forwarded, in which case it will trigger the external interrupt line. Now, if we go to the source code and load our SARS start code, we see that we already have a trap handler defined. In a word, useless. We'll erase it. We'll define a different one in just a bit. We will also remove the previous attempt at manipulating the relevant registers. We'll start over. So what we essentially want is to call IRQ init at the very beginning of our code. Of course, we'll need to define it. And since this file is used for both the bootloader and the actual operating system, we'll do an if diff. Of course, at this point, we also need to define the actual function. The IRQ initialization is composed of mainly of writing to control service registers in the RISC-V. The authoritative definition of what is a RISC-V can be downloaded from the RISC-V website, and this is the privileged architecture document. Since we're dealing with control service registers and generally speaking, things that only apply to the machine mode, which is the most privileged mode in the CPU. This is the document we need. We can find here the trap register, which is called empty vec. And generally speaking, what we see here is that, assuming we put the lower two bits as a zero, which any valid address in RISC will be, we can place an address here and it will just jump to it when a trap or an interrupt is triggered. So we already have the code to begin doing that here. We'll take a function called trap handler entry and set it to empty vec. Of course, we don't have it defined, so we'll declare it. And we will declare it extern C. This indicates to the compiler that this uses a C ABI in order to communicate. This is important because, and we'll get to this much later in this video, this function is written in assembly. Of course, I have no intention of writing the whole interrupt handler in assembly, so we will also write a C++ function for handling, which will be the actual trap handler. But since this function needs to be called from this function, we will also define this function as an extern C, as a CABI function. At this point, things should compile, but not link. Of course, I need to save the changes here. And we need an include in order to access the control service registers. And here we go. We compile, we don't link because we don't have a definition for trap handler entry. In order for the CPU to handle interrupts, i.e. to respond to the fact that the lines change, it needs the interrupts to be enabled. This is done through a CSR called mstatus. We want the 32-bit version of the register, and the bit that interests us is called MIE, which stands for Machine Interrupt Enable. This, you'll notice, is bit 3 of the register. So in order for the machine to accept interrupts, this bit must be 1. Otherwise, interrupts are ignored. Moving to CSR, we have a bunch of functions for changing control service registers, read, write, and read and write. But at this point, I'll add a couple more. These are functions that map a single opcode of the CPU. So these are atomic operations and therefore need separate operations. We'll duplicate the CSR read write because it's very similar to it. We have CSR read set bit, set bits, and what it does, any bit that is one in value is set in the relevant CSR, and this is called CSRRS. And where there is set, there is also clear, which is called C. The other thing we may want to do is to define the bits of the relevant register. So 
M status MIE bit is three. Actually, we'll do mask, and so that's one shifted left by three bits. So with that, we can go CSR set read set bits of the CSR M status for M status MIE. So this will enable the MIE, the machine interrupt, or for the global interrupts. But beside the global interrupts, there are also settings for the specific interrupts, so the uh, software, timer, and external. These are defined in a, in a CSR called MIE, or Machine Interrupt Enable. Now, the interrupt enables are for the different execution levels of the RISC V. So they have user, supervisor, and machine. Our CPU only has machine mode, so these bits don't apply. And here we have three sets. The machine software, sorry, that's the wrong register. That's the MIP, the pending interrupt. We're looking for the interrupt enable bits, which are here. So the machine software interrupt enable, we have machine timer interrupt enable and machine external interrupt enable. So these are three, seven and 11. First we define them. So these are MIE machine software interrupt enable is bit is three machine software machine timer interrupt enable bit is seven and machine external interrupt enable bit is 11. And for each one of those, we also want the mask. So now we can enable the individual software timer and external interrupts. Let's do that. CSR read set bits, CSR MIE, and at this point, we want to enable just the external interrupt. So at this point, as far as the RISC-V is concerned, interrupts are enabled. An external interrupt will trigger it. But for that to be fully configured, we also need to configure the actual external interrupt controller. Now, if we look at the external interrupt line and we expand the block, we can see that it compares something to zero. So if this line is not zero, then it triggers the external interrupt. So what is this interrupt? This interrupt is an end between the active IRQs and the masked IRQ, the not of the masked IRQs. So here's how this works. We have something called an IRQ mask. Any bit that is one in the mask is ignored on the IRQ line. Let's understand why we need that. Suppose the UART is ready to receive data. However, we don't want to send anything. We do not want to be interrupted in such a case. So when we don't have data to send, we set the mask for the UART receive ready, or sorry, UART transmit ready, to one. This way, even if the UART is idle, we do not get interrupted. And of course, since we're just beginning, we want everything masked. But how do we set this mask? If we look at the IRQ mask, we can see that it gets its value from something called IRQ mask next. And we see that we have a couple of registers that if we write to them, change the mask. So what we see is that if we write to register at 500 hex and this is the hardware definition. This is software, this is hardware. Then 
any bit that is set in the request data, in the data that comes from the CPU, gets ORed with what's already set in the mask and gets put into the next mask. So writing to 500 is a bit way to set bits in the mask. Conversely, if we write to 580, any bit that is set in the request gets cleared in the mask. So 500 is set IRQ's mask and 580 is clear IRQ masks. We can define those in the registers we have here and actually we already have them defined. So if we go back to the init code, the first thing we want to do is mask everything. So we reg write to device num reg IRQ mask set and we write all ones. So this masks everything. So right now we told the interrupt controller not to pass any interrupts along, but we enabled external interrupts and we enabled interrupts in general. So we are ready to receive interrupts, but we made sure none will arrive. Let's double check that we still compile and we're still failing with undefined reference to trap handler entry. That's fine. So now let's implement the actual trap handler. The trap handler might be called for two reasons. It might be called because we received an external interrupt, but we might be called because of internal CPU states. For example, if we try to execute an illegal instruction, an opcode that isn't defined, the trap handler will get called. Same goes if we try to read from an unaligned address and a bunch of other reasons. So to check why we were called, we can use something called the M cause register. Now what we see is that the top bit will be set to one if this is an interrupt and zero if this is a trap, i.e. an internal cause, and the rest of the bits will tell us more details. So we can see that the traps can be instruction address misaligned, instruction access fault, illegal instruction, breakpoint, and so on. But we're currently interested in the interrupts. And the interrupts are, if this is three, this is a machine software interrupt, seven means this is a machine timer interrupt, and 11 says this is a machine external interrupt. These numbers should be familiar to us. They're the same numbers in the MIE register. So what we need to do now is right. Next, we need to differentiate the different interrupt causes. So uh, switch cause and and this is where our use of the of the bits before sorry that was in CSR comes in useful. So if this is MIE MSIE bit then let's call handle software interrupt. If this is a MIE MTIE bit and handle timer interrupt. And if this is an MIE MEIE bit, handle external interrupt. And default is uh, uh, handle invalid. This should never happen. Let me clarify, this should never happen because we don't have, the, the only thing it can be if it int one of those is a user or a supervisor mode and we don't have those in the CPU, so we're not handling them. So now we need to do some implementation here. These can be static, they're not used inside the file. Handle software interrupt and that's uh, to do implement.
and the rest are pretty similar at this point. So handle timer interrupt and handle external interrupt, which is the only one we care about right now. I'd like to make a very short interlude to talk about this channel's Patreon page. It doesn't bring in a lot of money, but every paid member is a vote of confidence I'm very grateful for. Recently, Patreon has enabled a free tier. They did this without really asking the creators, but I left it in. It's not like the paying members get anything tangible from their support, so I figured, why not? On Patreon, I post the more personal stuff. I've not yet completely figured out how the free tier fits in there, but it's definitely going to be more than the YouTube channel, at least to some extent. So if you enjoy watching my videos, please consider joining my Patreon page. Paid support would, of course, be greatly appreciated, but even the free tier means you cared enough, which is, an important, which is important for me to know. And now, back to hacking together an interrupt service routine. So this is an external interrupt. What we need to do now is go to the interrupt controller and ask it which IRQs are active, and we have a register that can answer that. Now, to be fair, there's a bug here because we don't care just about IRQ that are active. We care about IRQs that are active and not masked. So let's change the code here to fix the hardware. But now we can do active IRQs, reg read 32, device num, and we had it earlier in the file, reg active IRQs. And now we need to define bits for the different IRQs. And the only one we have right now is IRQ a UART TX ready, which is one. So now we go if active IRQs and that's bitwise end IRQ UART TX ready, if that's not zero then we want to handle UART TX ready IRQ. And the nice thing is that we can define that in a different file in UART.h. Let's check that we still compile. Uh, we have a Problem line 95. Yeah, we need to so we have two undefined references, one to handle UART TX ready and one to the trap handler entry. Let's start with the handle UART TX ready. So let's start with UART CPP. What we'll notice is that all the definitions we already have are for synchronous access. So we pretty much start off from scratch. We'll remove gpio.h because we don't need it for the actual operating system. And we'll call this uartsend raw. And we might as well define it. So that is synchronous send of the character. So how do we define UART send not raw, i.e. asynchronous UART send? We remove the GPIO here as well. What we need is a data structure where we can put the character until the UART is ready to send it. And then from the interrupt handler, we can read that character and output it. So we have a pair here, a tandem of UART send and handle UART TX ready. These are the two functions that both access the same data structure. Here's the thing about interrupts. Interrupts are asynchronous, which means we have no guarantee about when they arrive. They may interrupt 
any operation at any time unless, of course, we mask them. So we need a data structure that can handle this. There's a further complication because asynchronous operation, we already know that from multi-threading, and there what we're doing is using locks. But we can't use a lock here because unlike multi-threading, where one thread can go to sleep and the other wakes up, here the interrupt handler cannot wake up the regular code without terminating. So it cannot wait for the regular code. We need something that works without locks. Thankfully, there's a whole branch of data structures called the lock-free algorithms. And while I'm not a huge fan of lock-free algorithms, I am a fan of a subset of those called weight-free algorithms. So we're going to use the most basic, probably best known weight-free algorithm. It's a data structure called single producer, single consumer. At this point, we need to include producer one, consumer one dot H and we'll initialize a static producer one, consumer one with char as the type and that will be our UART buffer. So the general idea now is quite simple. UART send, we go UART buffer produce C and the handler goes UART send raw of UART buffer consume. Except yeah, you didn't expect it to be this simple, didn't you? First of all, we may merge interrupts. So it, it is possible, not, not with our current hardware, but theoretically, that when this gets called, we have two characters in the buffer and we can output both. Again, not with our current hardware, but theoretically. So it's good practice to put this inside a loop. So while, and we need a condition here. So the first condition is while the UART can accept characters. Now UART H uh, doesn't define the registers, so let's define them, okay? In order to define them, we need to check the hardware definition. So UART is device number zero. Next, we need to check the registers on the UART controller itself. And here we have just two registers, and those are reg UART data is zero, and reg UART status is four which of course means that this now turns into a reg write 32 device num reg uart data and so let's see how reg uart status works Regyort status returns 31 zero bits followed by whether we're send ready. So we're looking for bit zero of the status. Your status TX ready. So now we can reg read 32 from device num reg uart status. And if that, let's put that in a function. So and UART status. If that's different than zero, 
then the TX is ready. So now we go UART TX ready. We can consume. But wait, we had another condition. We said that we're only allowed to call consume if it's not is empty. So not UART buffer is empty. So this should clear the buffer so long as we have something in the buffer and so long as, well, we can send. So this works, right? Well, no. This doesn't work because we've disabled the interrupt upon initialization. Remember? We've disabled all of the inter. We masked all of the interrupts in the interrupt controller and we have not unmasked them. So the place to unmask them is here. We, we produce a character into the buffer, and at this point, we care about TX ready. So we'll do IRQ external unmask. So first of all, we need to define IRQ external unmask, and that should accept a UN32 of interrupts. And of course, the counterpart is mask. But we also defined this here, and obviously others may want to use it as well. So we'll move it here and we'll also make it C++ uh, C. In other words, we'll reduce the use of the preprocessor. Now, if you're wondering about why I'm not using all caps, the reason we're using all caps for C preprocessor is because they just do search and replace of the file with no consideration of context. Since this does do consideration of the context, I'm free to use better looking uh, notations. So now I can say, please unmask the, um, actually that's not IRQ, that's, IRQ EXT. EXT. Now, I think that's an abundance of caution, but I'm going to put an, a right right barrier here. Of course, now we want to define these two functions. So we want to change that into a IRQ external mask of and then the implementation just does this and of course the and mask is the corresponding clear so there you have it um, we produce the character into the buffer, and now it waits to be picked up. And then we unmask the interrupt, and if that's the first character, we'll get an immediate interrupt, because the UART is idle. The UART, the uh, interrupt handler, will pick up that UART TX is ready, and that UART buffer is not empty, and will send the character. And then it may be the only character in the buffer, or um, the TX will not be able to handle more than one character at a time, so it will exit the loop after the first, probably after the first iteration. Okay, so we exited the loop. What should happen next? And the answer is, it depends on the state of the buffer. Because if the UART buffer is empty, then what we want to do is to mask the interrupt. Otherwise, we'll be in the loop here. So IRQ external mask of So if we consume the entire buffer, we mask the interrupt, which will get unmasked if another character is sent. If not, if we exited the loop because we don't have TX ready, then the interrupt remains unmasked 
and we'll get called again when the TX is ready again. So yeah, this is fine. This should work. Let's see if it compiles. Okay, let's fix the errors. And yeah, that's it. We're back to trap handler entry not being defined. Cool. We're almost done. Okay, so this is arguably the most important part of this video. How do we write the actual trap handler entry? Okay, so let's create a file which we'll call irq wrapper.s. And this is an assembly file. Uh, throughout the video, uh, I've been making changes to the make files to accommodate uh, various changes we're doing, like adding the Saurus define. Uh, I've been doing this off screen, but this time we'll do it on screen. So um, we want Saurus RQ wrapper.s to also be compiled. We see that we compile. And we're still getting, obviously, the trap handler entry not defined because we did not define it. So let's do so now. So the first thing is we need to define the symbol. So that's trap handler entry. And that's enough to define it. But at this point, we still won't compile because we need to tell it that to export this symbol from the file. So we need to say global trap handler entry. And that's enough for things to compile, but obviously they won't work. For things to work, we basically need two opcodes. These are jump and link to the trap handler and machine return. So this jumps to the fu C function we defined for the trap handler. And when that returns, we return from the interrupt and we're done. Except if that's what we do, we're going to get random crashes that are horrible to debug. Here's why. When we call jump and link, what this does is this sets the current address we're executing on to a register called RA or return address, and then places this address into the program counter to go execute. So when trap handler does return at the end of the function, what it does is it takes the RA registers and copies that over to the program counter. So when we do the machine return from interrupt, the code from which we called the trap handler entry will get a garbled RA register that points here. That's not good. And what's worse, uh, RA isn't the only register that's gonna get garbled. We have a document called RISC-V calling convention. And this document contains a list of all the registers that RISC-V has, including the floating point registers, which our CPU doesn't have. So we don't care about those. So those are labeled X0 through X31. And for each one, it gives, first of all, an alternate name. For example, X1 is the return address register. So it's RA. And Second of all, it says whose job it is to make sure this register maintains its value. In other words, when we call a function, what assumptions can we make about the value of this register when that function returns? So x0 isn't really a register. Anything you write to it gets discarded. And when you read it, it always returns all zeros. So nobody needs to save it. And then if we look at RA, we see that the caller has to save it. In other words, when we call a function, when it returns, there's no guarantee what RA will contain. If we want it to contain any particular value, we need to save it. Then again, if we look at X2, which is the stack pointer, we see that this register is callee saved. In other words, when we return from the function, we're guaranteed to get the same stack pointer we had when we called that function. The global and thread pointers are special cases. There are registers that no code written in C or C++ will ever touch. 
so they're neither color saved nor coli saved. But for all other registers, we have a list that says these are color saved, these are coli saved. What does that mean for us? Our contract, our responsibility, is return from the trap handler with all registers exactly the same as when we got them. All of this color saved, coli saved, these are only for function calls. They do not apply to interrupt handlers. That's why we had to write the trap handler entry in assembly. Now we need to arrange an alternate location where we can save all of the registers, call the trap handler, restore all of the registers, and return from interrupt. This is the only way our interrupt handler won't crash the program. Except we can't access the memory without using a register for the address. That's the way the RISC-V is built. But we need to maintain the value of all registers. How can we possibly do that? Turns out, you actually can. So this is where the RISC-V architects left us a hook to use. If we go back to the privileged machine document, we have a register called M scratch. The M scratch register is a scratch register, like the name suggests, which means we can put anything we want in it. Now, the thing is, this register isn't part of the ABI. C and C++ will never use it, and we can use it exactly for this purpose. So here's the plan. We'll set up a dedicated stack just for the interrupt handler. We'll store this stack pointer inside the scratch register. And when we enter the interrupt handler, we'll swap the scratch register with a stack pointer. So first thing we do is CSRW, which is the swap with control service register of M scratch with the stack pointer and the stack pointer. Let me just make sure that I got the syntax correctly. Okay, got the position of one of the registers wrong. It should be CSRW SP M scratch SP. Okay, sorry, CSRRW control service register read and write. So it reads from M scratch to stack pointer and from stack pointer to M scratch. Okay. And we do the same thing at the end. So now we need to save a bunch of registers to the new stack we have. The way to do that, push to the stack, is to first make room and then write the registers to the room we created. So first thing we do, we add immediate, let's uh, line up everything. To the stack pointer, we add the stack pointer, we move the stack pointer minus some number. We'll figure out that what that number needs to be a bit later. And now with the stack pointer pointing to the new location, we can just, we can start storing the registers to the stack. Which registers? Well, we could actually store only the color saved registers, but we'll save all of them. So we don't need to save x0, and we won't save the global pointer and the uh, thread pointer, but everything else goes in the stack. Okay, so we want one will go to offset zero, and two will go to offset four, because each register are four bytes, and then three and four we skip, and then we have okay one complication x2 is the stack pointer which means that it's not pointing to where to the stack pointer we actually want to save it's pointing somewhere random it's pointing to the interrupt stack so before we can do this we need to do csr read from m scratch to x1. At this point, x1 was already saved, and since x1 is RA, which we're going to overwrite in the jump and link, we can use it for anything else, 
which will in this case will be the old stack pointer. So here we save x1 into this address. And then we go which also clarifies how much we need to save. So we need to subtract 7, 4 bytes from the stack pointer to leave room for everything. Sorry, that's 7, 8. One last optimization, which may seem strange. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the fetch from the scratch to x1 a bit later. The reason for this is the pipeline. I want to make sure that I can actually use x1 without overriding it. Now, the CPU will not override x1, but the CPU is executing several instructions at the same time. And if it sees a conflict, it may delay the next instruction. So this instruction, if it happens here, may be delayed. So I'm postponing it. And again here, this instruction, if it happens immediately after this one, x1 may not yet be ready by the point we try to execute it. So again, I'm delaying it until it is. This way, this executes faster. At this point, all the registers are saved and I can call our trap handler. And after I'm done, I need to restore them, right? So in general, this just means repeating this here, except changing SW to LW. But that's not entirely true. I'm using X1 to restore the stack. So I want to restore X1 last. I need to write the X1 to the scratch. And for the same reason, I want to space them out. So I'm reading the stack pointer location into X1. I'm writing X1 to the scratch, and then I'm restoring the real X1. And then again, I'm swapping scratch and stack pointer, which puts everything back in order. Of course, one last thing, we need to increase the stack pointer before we do. Let's see if this compiles. Okay, we are almost done. The last thing we need, we need to put the stack pointer value into M scratch. So we go to IRQ and to the init code, and we need to CSR write to CSR M scratch, and then we just need to put in the value of the stack pointer. So we'll do eight zero 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 eight zero zero zero. Just trust me that it's available for this. Make sure everything compiles and we can begin testing. Testing, or more precisely debugging, took four days. Funnily enough, the problem was not with the code we wrote, but with the CPU itself. I'm using the VexRisk V, which is a modular Risk V implementation. I generated the minimal configuration CPU for obvious reasons. It turns out that the configuration did not have the M scratch register, really. As soon as I fixed that problem, the code you just saw me write just worked. To verify that, we can add a raw UART write after the regular writes. When we compile and run, we see that the character is printed at the beginning, which makes sense because the usual text gets buffered, whereas the raw text gets output immediately, so it bypasses it. There is still one bug left, having to do with a buffer filling up. But this video has been way long enough. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching.